So good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and pick up the afternoon session. Y un cambio que vamos a hacer es, uh, uh, we want to make sure that the reasons that you came here are covered in the form of your questions, your desires, uh, and everything short of money. I don't have money, okay? Uh, but we want to make sure that, like, uh, uh, sorry, was it Chris? Chris? Chris had some specific questions that he wanted to make sure that we cover. So while we're covering this material, especially on my part, stop me and ask me. And if nobody stops me, I need to warn you, I'm a walker and I like to ask questions. I want to keep you awake, okay? So my name is, Rich, oops, sorry, Richard Martinez. Sorry. Right. Um, if I'm in Louisiana, I say my name is Richard du Martinez because that's the way they pronounce my name there. Este, so the changes in power, what we're going to talk about for a little bit, and what's going on, and it's really not about a platform. I hate talking about platforms and products and stuff. It's really about what you as customers are doing in your business that is transforming or forcing, right, the manufacturers to change. So I told you a little bit while ago that I work for a different company. I used to work for IBM a long time ago in the 70s. And yes, I'm very old. And uh, I started working in what they call the channel and specifically the distributors. So as our, us, as Tech Data now, uh, it's a conglomeration of many different distributors. We actually sell everything to, the, to our, whereas uh, we aggregate all the suppliers' solutions and then we provide them to uh, companies like, uh, like ITC. So sometimes we get asked questions, well, so what's so-and-so doing? If you're interested, you can stop and ask me. I can also tell you what's the fastest growing areas and things of that nature. So this is one that's dramatically changing. It's power. So I wanted to share with you what's happening there. And then a lot of our customers will ask me, well, Richard, what does that mean? Uh, I used to run an AS400, now then called an I-Series, and, and now it's just referred to as the IBMI operating environment. How, who, who ran, who grew up with AS400s? Anybody? The big boys. In those days, big boys, okay. And before that, the AS400 grew up from a different platform. Not a different, it grew up its predecessor platform. That was the 3X. Anybody go that far? You did? Okay, so. <laughs> he, he's, he's, he's as old as I am, I guess. <laughs> oh, you go further back than that? 36, 38, 32s. Keep punches. 34, okay, yeah, he's as old as I am. Okay. Okay. The reason I bring that up is that's a big concern because a lot of applications that were built in those days are still running today and they're running the core business of a lot of companies. And, and, and uh, there's a lot of discussion. Oh, this is all going to go to the cloud. And this, how many of you have gone completely 100% to the cloud? I'll get you a dot. Anybody, you know what a dot is? The Amazon, the little dot things? I've never given one away because everybody says, everybody talks about you need, everything's going to the cloud, and yet nobody has gone 100% to the cloud because it's, it's, a, it's a bunch of security issues. But so let's, let's talk about really what runs the business is the core. And the core started out with a database. Okay, how, who here has only one database? One database. Who's, okay, so how many, who's got two databases in their house? More, right? So who's got Oracle? DB2. If you're, if you're an I-Series, you have DB2 embedded into it. It's embedded in the, micro, in the operating system. Uh, so MySQL, right? There's a lot of them. And so what's happened over time is every decade or so, the scene changes because the business that you're running and the business that you're asked to by your bosses to create for them to keep up with what your customers want is changing. And so right now, what we're into is an era that IDC calls the cognitive era. And you might think, oh, how many of you feel comfortable with IoT? You've heard IoT? What does IoT stand for? Internet of Things, okay. Do you deal with IoT? Okay, 
So IoT, the easiest way to understand it is, how many of you have one of these? It doesn't have to be an iPhone, but a smartphone. This is a perfect example of an IoT. And I had somebody argue with me, no, it's not. And I said, yes, it is, because guess what Google, uh, Apple, all of them, what are they doing with the information that you're doing here? And what do they do with that data? They sell it. And they sell it to businesses not unlike yours to find out what is Richard doing in Puerto Rico. He doesn't belong here. What's he doing here? Where is he visiting? What is he Googling, right? And all of that information has to go somewhere. So lots of information coming from everywhere and businesses today, the challenge is, what do I do with the data? One of us, where, is I, where am I going to store it? Right? And that's what Tony was talking about. How am I going to manage it? How am I going to deal with it? But it's all kinds of information. And that's the challenge today. And uh, so these are the factors that are causing, these three things that are causing the biggest change with the power system right, for IBM. And, and, and it's, uh, it's something that they want to address very rapidly. So on the left over here, what we have is your regular business that you run. Um, I'm going to pick on somebody. Juan. You're Juan, right? Yeah. Okay, good. My eyes are a little off. Juan, what's the most important thing to you in your company? Finance? It's Friday. When do you get paid? <laughs> uh, what do you do? Operativa? Uh, Ven como? Vanessa. Yeah. Vanessa. Este, uh, we can't pay him unless we have money coming in. So it's about accounts payable, accounts receivable, more important. The two most important things in any company is getting money in and being able to pay the people that you owe. Period. We could say we're in this business or that, but anybody will tell you, the CFO, I only care about one thing, money coming in and how much money is going out, and there better be more coming in than there's money coming out. That's, that's the core. So my transactions, I better be selling, right? And, and the less that we pay, one, the better. Okay. Okay. Este. So then these other ones on the left, we've got information coming from all sorts of sources. We just said it, IoT stuff, uh, devices, the utility companies, right? Uh, where I live, all the utilities are all modernized. Nobody goes around, nobody even drives down the street to find out what, how much you, electricity you've used or anything. It's all electronic, right? They measure everything. They know what you consume. And they're selling, my, my utility company in my town, I live in a little town, they sell my information. I don't know what gave them the right to do that, but I think they changed the law. Yeah, we won't go there, right? <laughs> it's the, and then there's social data. Those four areas are the biggest areas. How do we maintain the business to keep running, but how do we deal with all the information that's hitting us from all sorts of places? And so on the right-hand side is the ways that information's flowing, whether it's coming from the cloud, uh, whether uh, I'm doing something locally uh, in my, oh, by the way, who works in the IT shop? The IT shop, yes. Yes, IT shop, all right. Is all the information in your company in the IT shop? No. There is more information outside of the IT shop in the average company nowadays in the United States than anywhere else. Okay? So we'll talk about that in a little bit. And, and so now it's about cognitive. And IDC is, is helping everybody understand that cognitive is being able to do something very intelligent with the data. It's not just about, uh, it used to be in the old days it was called data warehousing and then data uh, business intelligence and then d business analytics and now it's about cognitive because if I can have all that information feeding it into some server or some system and have it make decisions for me that I've told it based on these parameters you start making decisions for me I can stay ahead of the competition across the street okay so when this started coming out and IBM started sharing that with me and says that's what we're going to be doing with power I'm by the way I'm the one responsible for the excuse me, the power line in our, in our firm. I said, is this really true? So we got on the road and we started going to a lot of the conferences that I'm gonna show you in a minute, some of the data that came back. And customers like yourself all over the North America, they said, this is where it's at. This is where the owners are concerned about. What do I do with that information, okay? Uh, 
The problem is for the IT manufacturers is the bottom. Does it, without getting too technical, does everybody understand how a, a chip, a processor chip, is what it's made out of? Silicone? Uh, the silicone is being sliced so thin that the next time they slice it, they're going to slice an atom. What happens when you slice an atom? Atomic bomb. It's an exaggeration, but that's where they're at. They can only get so much out of silicone, and that's it. So they've got to be different ways. Not so much how do my processor goes faster, but how do I move data faster in the entire system or network? So now you've got things like hyperscaling, convergence, hyperconvergence. It's all about how do I move information from here to there to there to there and get it in the right place at the right time. Okay? So, what IBM's done is this year, starting in January, they reclassified the power system. In the future, it, be, it is already being referred to as a cognitive systems. So IBM decided they're going to make the anchor the power system for cognitive computing moving forward. Now, why didn't they do that on Intel? Because they sold off their Intel line, right? They sold off the Intel line. So this was already planned a couple of years back ago. They just now started to make that release. So when I start doing this and I say, I'm going to introduce power to the cognitive world, wow, are you going to implement a million dollar system to do analyzed data? It's kind of expensive. If you do, I'd like to talk to you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so they had to start getting ready. It's about changing the way that my processors not are just built, but the way they work with each other and they work with everybody else. Okay? And the, the, the third bullet we're going to talk a little bit more about, I'm going to start sharing with you, and your name? Dennis. Dennis. Dennis, let's say that you and I used to be competitors, but now we cannot help our customers unless we start working together. And that's what Open Power is about. We'll talk about that in a minute. Because if we work together and come out with a new innovative way to approach uh, business problems, we're going to help everybody and it benefits all of us. So they took, this is what's very radical for power, the brand, they turned their hardware intellectual capital and they released it. So who other than Chris knows what Linux is? What is Linux? And so what does open source mean? That's right. Who owns it? Everybody. Everybody does. Nobody does, right? So the, through that, though, are they able to solve problems faster? Yeah. By the way, so who, who are the, t anybody that's a, te a technical person, a code writer? Anybody here? Okay, no offense, right? If you are, my brother is one. Code jocks love to solve problems. And in their world, when a problem comes up or an opportunity and they put it out there in their network, they all jump at it to try to solve it together quick or faster, and then they all they they like to go have beers and brag about it. Right? What an ingenious idea to do that with a hardware. So IBM Power is the first one to ever do that. Okay? They share that in, the, in a consortium. It's called a foundation now. That's how they're going to uh, uh, approach and, and really advance the system into a true cognitive system. Okay? Now, so the question is, whoa, wait a minute. I've got AIX. And, and I'm sorry, it's not about AIX. It's about your applications. It's about your workload. It just happens to be running on AIX. It just happens to be that I'm running an accounts payable package that was written way back in the late 70s that was running on 3X, AS400, iSeries, Power Now, and it happens to run under IBM I. It's not about, manufacturers like to make it about their product. It's about your workload, okay? And where do you want to put it? So if we start addressing those other things, are they going to abandon this? And the answer is no. What they're going to do, and they're already doing it, and you probably didn't know that, is they're already adding in code, like an AIX, an IBM I, 
OpenStack software. They're embedding that in there so that you can easily link up to the cloud or to your other applications that happen to be on open source. Okay? So they're making those investments. The other thing is, this is the roadmap. So don't be afraid that IBM is going to stop maintaining AIX or IBM I. There's a, a chart just exactly like this for IBM I, and it goes off into the future. Okay? So it's there. You don't have to worry about that. Again, they're adding to the technology now that it's innovating from the open world, they're working together to bring that. The operating system is the key. It's not the system, it's the operating system. And that, this is what this chart does. It's to guarantee to you that they're well into the future to sustain that operating system environment so it continues to run. And adding features and functions to it from the outside world, embedding it so if, when, if and when you're ready, you can hook that. You, you're just, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Vanessa, sorry, Vanessa. You, you just can't wait to put his paycheck information out into the cloud now, right? Yeah. I'm being facetious, but there are certain things that you do and certain things you don't. Okay? Now, this is IDC's view, and this is one where everybody loves to say everything's going to the cloud, and, and, and it's not true. It depends. Most companies are actually doing clouds internally to service your, cust your customer, meaning your your people in your organizations. So what's happening is they're looking at it and they're saying, they, uh, I, this is a worldwide study IDC did with customers like yourself. They say, where are you making investments? They used to say everything's going to the cloud. Nobody's going to be buying hardware in the future because they're going to the cloud. Well, somebody's going to have to buy that hardware, but this is within your data centers. This is IT spend in customers. And notice what's happening right here. In 2017, this one happens to be hardware right here. Look at what they're projecting as we go to 2020. This is strictly from the standpoint, what's happening is something that we're going to get into in a little bit, is these workloads have to be processed somewhere, and some of this critical data, most companies in the FinSER, financial services, retail is a little weird, a little careful with that, and the government especially, they need systems that are able to process cognitive and they don't want to put it on the web. They want to go get the web information. They want to get the information or the data they have from web services and bring it in. But this is secret. I don't want anybody to see what I'm doing with it because this is going to make me uh, be at an advantageous situation over him so that I can compete with him more effectively. Yes? Yes. Yes, I have another one. I didn't put it in here. I, I, I have it on my other deck. It's the one that IDC just did last month. May. Yeah, I'm in the right month. Yeah, June. May. And so, so we have a partnership with IDC. They keep us abreast of it. And to your point, they just showed us the fastest grow, growing area is still yet IoT devices from a hardware standpoint. But that's causing a lot of pain on everybody because information's coming so fast and they don't know where to put it. So they've got to have the right storage mechanism to store it. Now I've got it stored. What do I do with it? Right? What I do with it is the problem. And when I'm going to do something with it, I, got, I have to have compute capability. Whether I call it a compute node, a server, a, a systems cluster, I don't care what I, have, what I have. I have to do something with that data. And then how fast I can get to it and make decisions real time is the difference between whether Juan wins or I win. Okay, that's what they're telling IDC. Um, so this is the lineup today. I'm going to be embedding in my in our discussion where Power Nine is going to go. Everybody, does everybody understand the the nomenclature of Power Eight, Power Nine, Power Ten, Power Seven? That just happens to say what your generation level of your power system that you have. That's all that is. In Power Eight. They decided when they launched it over uh, just a little over two years ago, they made these changes and they started embedding the strategy that I'm talking about into it. 
So on the far right-hand side, this is what you're used to. Those of you that have power systems or an I-series in the old days or a P-series or whatever, um, and, and they're the type where you would, you start out with this, and when you're ready and you have need for more performance out of that system, you're just going to do an upgrade. Okay? You're going to do an upgrade, and you just upgrade it. That's what's on the right-hand side. In the middle, they introduce something new. These systems are getting to be so powerful, the majority of our customers that run IBI, sorry, IBMI, there's an IBI, IBMI, operating system environment, they don't have a need for as much power that's in these systems. So they said, I don't need something so expensive. I don't need a million dollar system. I need something less, ex less expensive. And so they came out with the scale out. So they um, embraced the Intel market's nomenclature for scale out. That means when this one gets full, it only grows this big. It won't upgrade anymore. So if I need more, I either have to get a bigger one or I just get another one, okay? So that's what scale out does. Within the scale out right there, you can see that these systems, depending on which models you go with, they can handle all three cultures. They can handle AIX workloads, IBMI workloads, and Linux workloads all in one system, exactly the way that the big guys do it, with one exception. The big guys are more virtualized, so they can ju you can just spin up another virtual environment and, and, and scale up. These will only scale up to the capacity of their system, okay? And then you have to cluster, okay? So the ones on the left are the ones that came out new. Remember we said through this consortium or this foundation, the sharing knowledge and all that, then there were some new players on the, on the market. They said, well, I like that. I like what you've got. I'm going to build this around it and make it do this. And when I do that, I know where I'm going to sell it. Well, IBM looked at that and said, well, I like that too. Let me, can you paint it black and put an IBM logo on it? And that's what an LC is. On the, on the, on the end, like an S812 LC, that means it's made by somebody else. So IBM, they tweaked it a little bit for, for, to meet the IBM specs, but all of these do only Linux, only Linux, okay? And, and we'll see why in a minute. Does that make sense? And they're super cheap. Those are super cheap. Chris, so you, you're interested in Linux, power on Linux. The, you, you're, it's like you're walking into the candy shop, where are you going to run it, right? It depends. What does it depend on? The workload. What are you going to do with it? How fast are you going to grow? Right? The ones on the left, the LCs, the workloads that run there in the Linux environment, they're very much like in the Intel world, so it, it doesn't matter it's a power chip. I'll tell you where the differences are in a minute. But in, a, in an Intel world, everything runs in clusters, clusters of three. So if you're going to run workloads, uh, maybe you've got some app that you're going to write on, on a NoSQL database, and you're going to run that. They're going to tell you, well, you've got you to put it in clusters of three. Power VM. Mm -hmm. So, no. Ooh, good question. He asked, is a Power VM or run? Oh, sorry. Did you say VM or Power VM? Power VM. Okay, so Power VM and VM are two different things, right? So Power VM runs on the scale-out models and above, and on the, on the LCs, it's strictly AVM. The reason is the Linux, a true Linux person doesn't care about architect, doesn't care about infrastructure, right? And in their world, what they're working with right now, the majority, that's another IDC study, the majority of the new applications that are being written today and being rolled out, desarrollado, están desarrollando todas estas aplicaciones, están usando Ubuntu. ¿Eh? Son tres uh, distros, les dicen distros de Linux. Es uh, Red Hat, SUSE, también. Pero las tres mayores son esta, estas tres. Red. Unix, es... Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, where did Linux come from? From yeah, Unix. It's, it's, uh, the, the, the code jocks that created Linux originally were Unix guys that wanted to do something, and they were being prohibited because it's proprietary. And they said, no, let's share. Let's work together and create something. And we'll, we'll create this dynasty out there. But the dynasty is not owned by anybody. It's by everybody. And it grew like wildfire. Okay? So that's the differences there. Now, the Open Power Foundation is made up of a, bu a bunch of people all over the world that, uh, that's in it with IBM. And IBM doesn't own it. It's owned by everybody, everybody that's in here. And even we're part of that. And, and you provide some kind of value that's on those rings. But the idea is that you're sharing everything that you do, you share it with everybody else. And through this is where the ideas go, are created on, and it's all about how do I get information faster so that I can look at it faster, so that I can make decisions faster, so that I can get into the cognitive world. Because that's where the next big competitive area is. Who can turn cognitive on faster than the other person? Este, this is an example of what that open foundation innovation allows to do. Este, in the Intel world, it's the picture on the left. You move data. It doesn't matter how fast the processor is, but you've got to get the data from storage to memory to processor back out and, and switch it around. The fastest you can move data is going to be the slowest link in the system which is the I.O. bus. How fast does it run on Intel? 16. That's the fastest you can move data. Okay? So, so and, the, and the 32 gigabyte example is it's, it's moving back and forth, right? Moving back and forth. 16 up, 16 back. This was created by NVIDIA, when I, one of the partnerships in the open source. And they created what's called NVLink. Uh, who knows what a GPU is? Okay, very good. What are they for? Yes. So the latest GPU from NVIDIA, it's been out for a little while, is a P100. It has three, over 3,500 microprocessors and embedded memory in one little tower chip like that. They're super hot. Don't touch it. <laughs> They're super hot. They cost about $12,000 list. They're exactly for what you said. I have a lot of information. I want to put it in there, and I want to do something with it, figure out what I even have to begin with. And then I find out that half of the men in this room are wearing blue shirts, so maybe I ought to do something about that, right? Because all I do is I sell red shirts. Anything, it doesn't matter. It depends on what your business is that you want to analyze all that information that you've got stored on a multitude of different types of disks, a multitude of and even tapes, and what do I do with that? So, so by the way, let me just make sure we all understand. What's the most valuable thing that your company has? And it's not you. <laughs> is what? Information. It's all about information. Otherwise, that's why Google, you know, Google can't afford to give you all that free space out there for a personal level. I mean, my kids, I had a hard time making them understand. Get off of there because they're collecting all that information about you and they're selling it. They're selling you, right? That's what they're doing. Information is king, okay? So, NVIDIA came out with an NV link and are able to make the highway larger, wider. Not faster, wider. So it's about throughput. What's the name of the, ¿cuál es el camino que está en frente del aeropuerto? No sé el número. ¿Qué es el número? El que corre de Fajardo a, a San Juan. 66? Okay, 66. Well, okay, 66. ¿Cuál es el problema? ¿Cuál es el problema que tiene en la mañana si quieres ir a Bayamón? Why? How do you fix that? 
Oh, you got to knock down all those buildings. I, I've never seen so many towers in 10 years that I've been here. Tons of towers. What do I do? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to, uh, eminent domain. Everybody know what that is? Domain? <laughs> eminent domain is where the government comes in and they said, I don't care if it's your house. I'm going to knock it down because I'm going to make the highway bigger. What's your name? He's going to kick you out because Lisa's going to make the highway wider and you're out. <laughs> what are you going to do? In Texas, I guess, so mira. <laughs> it, it's a problem, though, right? If you can get more cars, the answer is not to drive faster, because you can't. The traffic's there. Is to get it up to the speed limit. Yeah. Stop having babies. How many kids do you have? We got to slow down the population growth, slow down the data. That's what they do with China. Well, not anymore. They, they increased it from one to two. You see the problem? Huh? So how do we do that? And Intel, IBM, it doesn't matter who the manufacturer was, the processor chips, they all run into the same problem. I cannot slice that atom because something's going to blow up. How do I make things faster? It's not about making them faster. How do I get more information through? And NVIDIA is the one that came up with the answer on this one, working with everybody else. Those other 300 plus people, they figured it out and they said, let's create a bus that's bigger. Let's knock down the problem. NVIDIA, at the end of the year, is going to release their add-on GPU. It's the P100, I don't know what they're going to call it. They're going to, at the end of the year, they'll announce a new one. How many processors did I say are in it today? Over 3,500. The new one's going to have 15,000. Now what's the problem? The same thing. So this is great for right now, but that's not going to be enough for, for next year. So you see where the... So who's going to fix it? The group of people. Okay? And that's where it goes on and on and on. So right now, if, uh, if, you're running, if you're running any workloads on those GPUs, by the way, anybody heard of a company named Tesla? All right. Tesla is synonymous with NVIDIA. Those what's, what do you think those cars are doing? To be able to get you from here to there. By the way, Uber in New York already tested it to run cars with no driver, no physical driver. It requires a lot of sensors, a lot of IoT. Where's all that data going? Who's processing it? The GPUs to be able to do that, right? So, and, they're, and it's not enough. Whatever we have today is not enough for tomorrow. And it's going to grow exponentially, right? So. It's about getting more information. So they created a pipe. So does Intel have that on the roadmap? Because Intel said, no more NVIDIA. I don't want you anymore. I want to do it myself. I want to cut everybody out. Intel's going more pri proprietary than open now. They want that business. So they're going to take, and they're creating, and their new processors, multi-core processors that are, that are pretty dense. So I asked him, because the guy who runs Intel sits next to me. <laughs> so what are you going to do? Are you going to have 15,000 at the end of the year? I mean, you don't want NVIDIA. NVIDIA is going to 15,000. You're not going to get into that market, not, not at the speed you're going. So um, this is the line of those LCs. They run KVM only. That's how you virtualize them. They run Ubuntu, RHEL, SUSE doesn't matter. And they have different flavors for different reasons. If I'm doing HPC, high performance computing on the left, if I'm doing extremely dense data analytics, business analytics, if I'm going to crunch a bunch of data, I want that middle one. And all the way on the right hand side, that's for compute intensive. That's, that's where you're going to run into more of the cases where you're going to wind up putting a GPU. You might put it in the middle one, but for sure on the right hand side. That's what that is. This is not the power systems we grew up with. In a minute, I'll show you some of the price ranges. These are priced right up in Intel prices. Okay. So if I'm going to do something unique, again, Chris, it depends what you're going to do with it, right? What is your workload? 
Okay? Um, the big ones, does that mean we're abandoning the big ones to only do AIX and, and IBM I? No. También van a tener todo lo mismo. On the drawing board is to put GPUs in the big boys too. Okay? But in the meantime, we don't need it because in the meantime, I can create, the big ones are about scaling up so I can virtualize that and I can run Linux environments. Right? Uh, what they did is they came out in the middle of the year, and what you're going to see from now on, there are going to be changes to the technology that you're not aware of, and they created these, they call them C's, it's a C at the end. That means those are the ones when they came out and when they started shipping them, they look exactly like the other ones, but they have all the code built into them for cloud ready. All the open stacks are in them, okay? Oh, it's over there. I keep pointing at the screen. Why does everybody do that? They point at the screen like it's going to change, right? <laughs> My son always says, why are you pointing over there, Dad? It's over there. <laughs> este, that's what we talked about here. This was the idea to start prepping for you as a customer to say when you upgrade your, if you've got one of the bigger boxes, uh, that you want to have that same capability in that box to be able to, Vanessa, to enable that application to be cloud ready to talk to your other systems of engagement if and when you're ready, okay? So we're talking about cognitive. Real quick then, in IBM's vernacular, the way they talk cognitive, it's about machine learning and deep learning. So, and then, and then you're going off into AI, artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? Anybody? <laughs> That's kind of, is that that scary stuff? That's real scary stuff. That is the ultimate. They're working on it like right now, right now, and it's, and it's functional. The difference is uh, machine learning is when you have everything in place in the machine so that it can learn from patterns that it sees. There you go. And then deep learning is where it's saying, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Luis. Luis. Hey, Luis. These people over here on the right hand side. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And it's letting Luis know, according to the patterns that you taught me to learn, I'm letting Luis know about certain situations so that he can take action on them. Yeah. AI is when you start telling it to do things for you. Yeah. Different, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Okay, so I was at some conference in 2016. Games like Mongo World, uh, Postgres Vision. These are all those new open source databases that they're catching on like wildfire. And I talked to customers like uh, Kroger's. You know who Kroger's is? You don't have them here, right? Kroger's, a grocery store. But they're in Atlanta. And yeah, on the East Coast. They're huge. They're very big. Dillard's department stores, a lot of them. And I talked to some of these uh, executives that were at the conference, and I said, so what? What are you doing? What are your strategies and all that? And they'll share anything with you. So Kroger's uh, grocery stores, and, and we have an HEB, one called HEB in San Antonio. It's huge, like John Numerous. And they're doing, they're doing the same thing. They want to know when Vanessa walks in the door, she's a loyal customer, and she has her cell phone turned on. They want to know when she's in. Hit her phone and say, hello, Vanessa. Yeah, you know, I was an advertising agency for two years, and we started to use that uh, a lot, a lot. They're doing that, okay. yes. Where is that coming from? It requires the IoT device, right? By the way, there's probably things that Vanessa does on that phone. She doesn't know that they're tracking. Vanessa, every time you walk into the store, you're always buying ice cream. You, what do you call ice cream? You call it mantecado or nieve? Mantecado, right? Okay. We were talking at lunch about the different ways we say the same thing. Okay. Say, uh, I'm not going to embarrass you, Vanessa. Luis, did you know that she's also buying pickles? A lot. I wonder if she's pregnant. Maybe we ought to send an advertiser. That's what they're doing. They're hitting you up by who you are, selective advertisement, 
And, no, I'm just kidding. She's not. She hasn't been buying ice cream and pickles, okay? <laughs> este, but she's such a loyal customer, I can give her a set of advertisements or coupons that you won't get, right? And you, all you got to do is leave your phone on. As a matter of fact, I can even tell you, by the way, here's what you buy the most. You want to click them off, and I'll show you what aisle they're on. Yeah. Right, all of that. That is cognitive, and it's happening right now. Kroger's is doing it. Walmart's doing it. There, there's several. Dillard's is doing it. So Dillard, uh, Walmart, let me tell you what Walmart's doing. They're different. They just went to AI. They're trucks that they route. Well, let's say that you have a truck that's going over to Ponce in the middle of traffic, and they're about to send the truck over for the supplies of the, tar of the Walmart store in Ponce. And all of a sudden, you have a storm that developed over here. And they find out that they sent most of the umbrellas, supplies, in the Walmart truck going to Ponce. And you got a storm that just developed over here. How long would it take to go reroute that truck? So Walmart right now is at the front end of AI, and they've got their delivery, their inventory, the weather, their patterns, they're collecting the information from the weather. They're also, everything else, they're collecting it. All this information coming in at one time, and they're processing it real time. AI, and the system will reroute that truck and have it come right back to San Juan, because that storm's supposed to hit right here, and I know we're going to sell umbrellas. You're going to need umbrellas, and I'm going to increase the cost by a dollar. It'll automatically change the price at the store. Do we have a beer account? That's what Walmart, by the way. So watch, if you ever have a storm like that, you know where you got that information from. Absolutely. So I, I don't mean to scare you, but how many people like to play with Google? How many are on Google? You on Google? Have you ever gone non-Google and you're out on the website and all of a sudden you get advertisements? You say, how did they know that I like that? They watch everything you're, wa you're, ser you're searching on. They know who you are. They know what you like, what you don't like. That's all businesses do. They, they want that information. So that's how all of this plays. <laughs> So what I just described, is it good enough to have the information stored in the latest storage devices out there? That's okay, but what am I doing with the data? I got to process it. I got to do something with it. And that's what these companies are doing very quickly. So here in Power 9, this is an example. I'm interlacing Power 8 and Power 9 together, so you'll see where it's going. Power 9, remember we were talking about that Envy link? And I said that the NVIDIA cards are going to go up to 15,000 processors. You notice that N NV2 is coming out? It's going to double that speed. So that's already projected. When, when Power9 comes out, it'll be in there. So they can move data faster. That's not in the P9 processor chip. That's what the community and the open power world is doing, prepping. Because IBM now, when, they're gonna, when they were developing it, they've been developing Power9 for the last year in the labs, functioning. And they've got these others in there with them saying, well, if we did this and we did that with it, and I'm going to plug this in here, and I need your code so I can do this, and we can double, triple the, the rate of the speed of the information. Okay? So that's what's happening there. The numbers there are projected against Intel's rollout of what they're going to have in the future. So it's not about how fast the processor is. It's about how fast you can process, how, fa how much more volume you can get of cars across 66 in traffic. If there's another IDC report that says, okay, so what are you using to process all that information? How many of you, I remember I asked you how many of you are still in the same database that you, you had before? You still might have it, it runs a core. How many of you have some of these open source databases? SQL, no SQL, no SQL doesn't mean not SQL, it means not only SQL. Uh, EDB is a relational database, just like Oracle, but it was created by open source community and perfectly supported 
for enterprise level computing. Uh, Redis is for document style, a, a database that allows you to store things in a document format. Um, I don't think they're all up there. I'll just name some of them. Neo4j is a graph database. The banks like to use that. The banks are going to that very quickly. They use that to find out somebody that's doing fraud. Okay. Uh, let's see, who else is up there? MongoDB. MongoDB uh, is, uh, is a not only, no, not only uh, SQL database. There's lots of them, but these are the prominent ones. If you look on ID, IDC's report, they'll say these are the strongest ones over here on the tri top right quadrant that most of you as customers are buying. To be able to grab that information, uh, so we had nobody in the IT department here. Nobody, you were. How many of you have gone to the IT department, knocked on the door, and I said, "I'd like to have this information because the boss wants to do this and this," and they just laugh. They say, "Go to Bas Baskin Robin. What does Baskin Robin have?" You grab a little number, wait in line, right? So what's happened is a lot of systems of engagement are actually being for their, before them is a, a database system over and over and they go grab the information and put it there so they don't bother the IT department. What's happened is there are literally a sprawl of servers around in every firm that have a bunch of these. So what we ran into at these conferences is there's a new job and it's called a database executive that's been created in companies just to figure out what are all the databases that we have and what are we doing with them because they've downloaded all this freeware stuff and what's in production, what projects were rolled out under which databases. They're trying to put their arms around their database strategy. Okay, That's what's going on. And that's what all this is because there's different kinds of information. There's video, there's pictures, uh, there's structured data and unstructured data of all kinds, and there's no one database that handles it all. It's a multitude of databases. Okay. Anybody on SAP? You are? We're on SAP too. You ever see anybody do things with a database that it wasn't meant for? Why, why do they do, why do we do, uh, we do that. We abuse SAP. It's not meant to do something, but we'll use it. Because our CFO says, I paid $100 million for that. You're going to use that before you use anything else. I'm going to go buy another one. Right? I'm going to suck the blood out of a turnip before I'll let you go buy another database. Right? And so that's why the code developers are downloading all the freeware. They prove it with a line of business executive who has money, and there you go and then they'll buy the enterprise license version of it, okay? So this is what's happening in this blue box right here. It's all about gathering the data. So if I go all through the, all these systems, and you heard uh, Tony talk about spectrum scale, excellent way to go out and get the data no matter what it is from wherever it is. I don't care. I'll go get it, right? And I bring it over, and I'm going to put it into something that he mentioned was Hadoop, whether it's Hadoop or Big Insights, which is IBM's version of Hadoop, they added some, some cool things on top, right? And some tools. And Hortonworks that adds some other things on top as well. And now I can start dis figuring out what I've got and start massaging that data and start doing something that can make my company different than the one across the street, okay? And it doesn't matter. By the way, this doesn't matter if you're a large company or a small company. This is what everybody's doing. Why? Because it's cheap. It's free, right? And, and so I'm, what I'm doing there is I'm creating a data lake, un lago. Porque antes del lago, no más tengo charcos. Charcos de agua aquí, charcos de agua acá, y allá. Y, y los tengo que juntar todos en un lago. Now what am I going to do with a lake? Analytics. Real time or not? So if I'm going to do real time with all that data, how much data is it? Two data lakes. And so you've got to process them in something somewhere that can handle that volume. And it's maybe not all of it, but you need to be able to move that data back and forth between the data lakes. 
And that's where your GPUs come into play. There's nothing right now uh, that's as fast as a GPU to do that, unless you've got billions of dollars. Okay? Estate. So again, then going back to these LCs, what IBM did is they went to, with all these ODBs, OSDBs, open source database companies and other Linux ISVs, and they said, show me what you're doing with your data. By the way, they're all in this foundation. And they're all taking advantage of the new structure, that new architecture, not just in the processor, but across. And what IBM did is they helped them optimize their code to make use of parallel processing, to make use of, uh, of, of the uh, NV, whatever it is, and they, made, they optimize, helped them optimize their code so that it would run faster and better. So, or, or throughput. So when you're doing a comparison like in this one, I could be running MongoDB. MongoDB is the enterprise version supported of Mongo. And if I'm doing that, uh, I could compare against an HP Intel processor that they would recommend. This is a configuration that Mongo says, if I'm going to run here, I need this size. And if I run over here on power, I need this size. And the price performance is every time better on one of these LCs. If I'm priced the same or, or very similar, to Intel processors, and I can open the data path bigger. Oh, and by the way, since it is a power chip, I'll guarantee you that I can run at minimum 65% utilization. And if I price, oh, is that software that you're running, is it priced per core? And on the Intel, you're going to need two cores, right, which happens a lot the license charge goes up. And on the power, if I run with less cores, the price of the software goes down. So CFOs like that, cheaper, cheaper. So this is what drives our price to be uh, tremendously more economical. And that's just with Power 8. Power 9 is going to be dramatically different. Okay. So what we're saying here is IBM, all they did with the power technology was open it up so that others could figure out how to make it more efficient, process faster movement of data, right, and be able to address the cognitive world. Because that's where, if you're not there yet, if you don't see it, it, it'll come to you pretty soon. It's coming real fast. Uh, this is example, so, so I told you, IBM will make a guarantee that you can run a minimum of 65% utilization. Um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I keep picking on you, right, Vanessa? Vanessa, what business is your company in? Cooperativa? I like credit unions. Yeah, I do. I really do. Uh, I really do. Okay, so for this one, take, help me out with this one. Um, you're going to guarantee to all your customers a certain level of performance. And let, whatever it is, it's X. Are you going to base that guarantee on the fact that that's what your threshold is or that you know very well you'll never, you'll never have a problem with that service level? You're going to be able to show up a very nice margin of error. Right? So if you told everybody that comes into the credit union, you will by certainty, I guarantee you that you will be serviced within 30 seconds. Can you do that, by the way? You're going to do it tomorrow, though, right? If she said that she was going to guarantee you could walk into her credit union, you were going to be serviced by somebody in 30 seconds, you know very well that they, that they can do it in 15 seconds. That their guarantee is 30 just so that, right? That's what IBM did on all these. If I could guarantee you 65% utilization, they're running at 80 to 85 to 90% utilization. They just don't want to get caught in any legal issue, okay? So what this is, these are uh, going beyond that. They're saying, I'll guarantee you that when you run Mongo or you run EDB, this is enterprise database running against, uh, or by the way, Oracle is trying to take as many customers to the Intel world because their hardware line is all Intel. But it requires more cores, so the price is going to go up. They don't tell you that. They won. Okay? And if I were to compare running the same thing that they're telling you over here, I can reduce the cost tremendously. And in the process, I'll guarantee that I can run it 2x more throughput. 
If I can guarantee that, you know that very well they're running at 3x. Hortonworks running until, I know Tony showed that chart a while ago. Hortonworks is guarantee is four. On power, Hortonworks, everything the same, just running on the, on the uh, same one year, two year server, running Hortonworks on power chip will run four times more throughput than on Intel. Okay? So if that's happening, what happened is all these database executives are coming in and says, I got too many servers, you got to help me, IBM. Somebody's got to help me because I need to have database as a service because I need to be able to, to corral that. I don't need them to keep buying servers. I need to be able to offer a cloud-based service internally so that you can come and code all you want to. Quieres desarrollar esa aplicación, ahí vamos, and keep going there. And within it, I don't care. I'm going to have all the different databases, right, and the stack the open stack in here for whatever you're going to do. So IBM just rolled this out, okay? They just rolled it out. You can order a power system, one of these systems, and, and have all the uh, open database software loaded on there. Not the enterprise version. This is where you can do whatever you want to, and then you go buy your enterprise license when you're ready, okay? The other thing that came out of it, and we talked about that already, um, is this. There are a couple of names over there on the bottom bullets. You see those names? Can you see them from the back? Any of them catch your eye? And do you know who that is? That's one of the world's largest uh, CSP MSPs, cloud. Um, these guys, along with Microsoft and their big project, the government's running, they have already consumed the initial shipments of Power9 chips, and they're not even out yet. Because they are all part of the open foundation, and Google is switching to Power Chips. Now, they just happen to build their own systems, right? And the foundation can build your own systems. They build their own white boxes, they're, okay? They're metal. Microsoft is doing it for Azure because Microsoft is in the cognitive. I don't know if you've seen those announcements. They like to advertise on their website they're, that they're leading. They're going to take all their cloud services and move them into to, to be able to give you cognitive solutions. Same thing with Google, right? And the same thing with Rackspace. It's funny how all of these people are all switching over to power chips. Okay. Because they're in this together and IBM sharing that technology with them, the architecture, okay? Uh, this is Power9, what it looks like, but who cares, because it's not about the processor, it's what they're doing with it, okay? Y luego, este, the other thing they're gonna do is, if, if in my, 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 the code, my instruction set, the other way, by the way, I can get, who, where do you go, oh, the way I get more traffic on 66, it's stop driving Wawa's. Get these little micro mini cars, okay? Half of the people out there that I saw were only one person in a car driving these big Wawa's. They take up more space, so if you're in a smaller car, can I get more cars? That's a the concept there. If I can reduce my instruction set, right, I can execute faster. So, move to the right. hmm? or move to the right. Move all the Wawa's to the right. You know, there's only one place that I've seen more Suburbans and more SUVs, more big vehicles like that, and that's in the state of Texas. Texas. We, we dominate the world on, on trucks, big trucks. And it's some of the shortest people. You know that, you know that Mexica, Mexican women are not like Puerto Rican women. They're only about this tall. My wife's that tall. And we have a big F-350 truck. She has a ladder to get in it. And she drives down the highway, and she's the only one in the car, in the truck. Okay? In Puerto Rican, she has a big heart. Big heart, absolutely. She lets me talk about her, and she won't get mad. <laughs> that's another presentation. Yeah, that's another presentation. What they're doing in there, too, is the data path and the memory path and everything inside the processor, they're widening it up. It's not about faster, it's about moving more data. Okay? So that's what they're going to do in the chip. 
And then within their structure of putting text is a, a technical term that within this uh, compartment of processors to the talking to the next one and below within a big racks, big systems, power systems, they're opening up a faster way to talk to each other. Again, how do I move more information faster? Okay? So this little diagram, I left this one in here because as we move into cognitive more and more, as we go into P9s and P10s, we're working on P10 right now, this is the open switch right here. It's that accelerator roadmap. It's through this open power foundation that about how do I create and, uh, and embrace and, and speed up accelerators, whether I'm using an accelerator card or an accelerator processor like a GPU, how do I accelerate data movement? And so there's, again, a different one. Uh, again, talking about the Power 9 on the top right-hand side, uh, the, the link for the, the NV link is, is going to be augmented. So that one's going to be over, over and above what we have today. It's going to grow. This is this number, whoops, sorry, 7 to 10 times faster. Not faster, throughput, sorry. More, more, more. So the last one I'm going to share with you is um, convergent. Anybody run converged systems in their business? Converge? You do hyperconverge. What are you using? Uh, we're doing for the uh, HV hyperconverge. HV hyperconverge. Okay. Are you using VMware? Yeah. Okay. So the point is, it doesn't matter whether what what you're using. It's a concept of hyperconverge or converge. And one's not better than the other, it's based on what you're trying to do, okay? So hyperconverged is all about uh, software, simplifying the, so the software management piece. That I don't care what you are, I don't care what infrastructure you are, I don't care if you're red, blue, red, or white. I'm going to treat you all the same. They're all nodes, and I need more storage, I just add another node. I need more processing capability, I'm just going to add another node. But I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, the, the management layer is so simple. Do you manage, have you ever seen the management layer? Have you seen the management tool for Nutanix? Okay. It's so simple because it simplifies everything. It treats everything equal, okay? Because all he cares about is the work he's going to do. In a hyperconverged world, they just want to just process workload. If that works for you in your environment, great. What we've got here is Nutanix happens to, to be one of them. Uh, so, um, the, so I have access to all the data that we see worldwide. Uh, Nutanix uh, grew again this last quarter. Um, it's been growing consistently between 50 and 60 percent year over year, right? The other ones are growing about 30. That doesn't mean they're slower. They have a bigger piece of the pie. So they're still growing fast, phenomenally fast. But Nutanix is growing faster because they're the new kid on the block. And uh, what they do is, the point is, they came over and said, I need power in my solution because it wasn't there. So power didn't have a hyperconverged uh, strategy. So Nutanix came and they said, so why do you need it? Because I asked them personally. The Nutanix guy sits to my right in the office. So why do they want it? And he says they want it for the high performance data bases and analysis. They wanted everything that we talked about. Whether it's, whether it's Kinetica running on GPUs, whether it's Mongo and all these, they're, they're, they're recognizing the markets opening them real fast and the need for these high-performance databases and business analytics. And that's why they wanted power on there. They didn't have, they didn't have the right solution on there because they're worried about the data path. If I start putting that on my network in a hyper-converged network and I'm starting to pull data from data lakes all around, what's going to happen to that network? It'll start dying, slowing down. Okay. So this one is the roadmap for the Power 9 and 10. Power 9 comes out next year as far as systems. Okay. The Power 9 chips come out this year, and they're going in a lot of these LCs and a lot of these uh, for rack space, government. The government's buying the, the largest quantity of them. Systems, they're buying the whole system up. Any other questions? where we're at, right there at two questions. No? Thank you, Vanessa. You've been wonderful. <laughs> I will join your credit union. <laughs> 30 seconds, right? Customer service? 30 seconds. I belong to a credit union right around the corner from me. 
and they're wonderful. They have great, they do have 30 seconds. They guarantee that within 30 seconds, one of their employees will talk to you. It doesn't mean that they're going to help service me, but they will talk to me. Yeah, very good. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to, is it break time, Luis? We'll have the rest of the afternoon if you come up with questions.